Will we see any of the Bearcats who were drafted on NFL rosters this upcoming season? Plus, just how much does Simus Lukosius elevate the Bearcats men's basketball roster? Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is the middle of the week, and we thank you very much for making Locked On Bearcats your first listen of every day, including on this day, Wednesday, May 3rd. My name is Alex Frank, your host of Locked On Bearcats. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including on YouTube. We are now 122 days away from the Bearcats season opener, Saturday, September 2nd at historic Nippert Stadium against Eastern Kentucky. I'm joined today by one of my favorite guests to have on Locked On Bearcats. He covers the Cincinnati Bearcats for the front office news, and he also does extensive work with the 48 Minutes Network, where he is a podcast host, and that would be none other than Neil Meyer. Neil, it's great to have you on. Great to have you back. I first want to ask you this, because this was my biggest takeaway from the NFL draft this past weekend as it relates to the Cincinnati Bearcats. How did Ivan Pace Jr. go undrafted? Like, wh what was your reaction to that? Yeah, man. Well, first off, I'd like to thank you guys for having me on. It's always a blast, yeah. so I appreciate you guys having me on. But on that aspect, man, we are all right there with you. I, I don't know how he went undrafted. In all fair, honestly, I don't know if it was a size concern. Obviously, he's an undersized linebacker. But, I mean, you look down at the stats he had, I mean – 137 tackles, uh, 21 and a half tackles for loss, 10 sacks. Like, what? what is there to doubt on the kid? I mean, the stats say it all. I mean, he was a AAC Defensive Player of the Year. I mean, we saw what he was able to do. And me personally, I I definitely thought we were going to uh, – he was going to hear his name called on, uh, on Saturday or even Friday even. But overall, I mean – I, I don't I don't understand how he went undrafted in all realistic honesty. I don't I don't know. I don't know how you mentioned the statistics. I don't know how a unanimous first team All American goes undrafted. And I, I I get it. If teams were worried about his size, that's understandable. But Neil, that size or lack thereof didn't impact his play on the field last year and most certainly not the year before when he was with Miami. So is there something that we're missing here? Is there, like, now that he has signed with Minnesota, do you think he's going to have, do you think he has the ability to carve out a role on on the Vikings roster come the fall? Yeah, I, I absolutely think there's a shot he makes that roster coming out of training camp. And the reasons why, I mean, everyone doubts his size and everything, but he has a knack to find the football, and we've seen that, uh, especially over at his time at Miami and his time here at UC. He might be a little undersized, and that might have been the biggest downfall, but he's he's a dang good ball player, and I'll say that. And, I mean, he's explosive. He's quick. He's fast. He can get back to the quarterback, and you can throw him out there in a lot of different ways, and we saw it uh, last season for the Bearcats. They used him on the defensive line a little bit. They brought him off the edge. They dropped him in coverage. I mean, they did a lot of different things with him, and that's what makes him unique. It's his versatility. They're gonna he's gonna shock a lot of a lot of people out there in Minnesota throughout minicamp and throughout OTAs. But most definitely, I think I think you will see him on an NFL roster this season. So you're saying if not, maybe if not the Vikings, certainly a roster this year. Yeah, you will definitely see Ivan Pace on a roster at one point this season. And I hope it's Minnesota because I think that fits perfectly for him, uh, especially at that linebacker position. We've seen the success that some of those linebackers have had out there in Minnesota in years past. So I love the fit for him out in Minnesota, and I love to see him go out there with a couple of Bearcat teammates as well. So I think that fits great for him, and I definitely think he'll make an impact there, out, hopefully out there in Minnesota this uh, this offseason and in, heading into the 23 season. Well, there's a chance we might see Ivan Pace if he does make the Minnesota roster. The Vikings do come to play the Bengals in Cincinnati 
this upcoming season. A good team for Ivan Pace to be signed by as an undrafted free agent. A Vikings team who went, I believe, 12-5 and five last year. If my, if my memory serves me correctly, it was either 12-5 and five or 13-4 and four and made the playoffs NFC North champions. Now, let's get to the guys who were drafted, Neil. Uh, Trey Tucker went in the third round. Tyler Scott in round four. And Josh Wiley in the fifth round. What do you make of where they went? And do you think it, Tucker went to the Raiders, Scott to the Bears, Wiley to the Titans? Do you think any of those guys have sh- have chances to make their respective rosters this upcoming season? Yeah, I think I think all three will make the roster. And the reason is we will start with Trey Tucker. I mean, his versatility is the big thing that teams loved him. Obviously, we all know he has the blazing four point uh, three speed. Uh, we saw it up close and personal at Pro Day and throughout his career here at Cincinnati. But what makes him unique is his ability to really affect the games in many different ways. I mean, you look at him as a slot receiver, but we saw it up close and personal when uh, the Bearcats played Indiana in 2021. That kickoff return touchdown that easily shifted the momentum in that game. Easily. But we also saw him at Pro Day working out as a kick returner and punt returner. So we got an up-close look of what teams were asking him to do at Pro Day. And there was one drill that really stood out to me in mind, and that was he was actually asked to catch punts one-handed. So, I mean, the versatility is there. I mean, I love the fit form out there in Las Vegas. You throw him in the slot next to Devontae Adams, potentially. You'll bring some speed on the edge, speed in the slot. And we saw how, how much damage he can do in open space. So, I mean – if you can kind of get him in that slot next to a guy like Devontae Adams, who's a great mentor for Trey to learn under, I think Trey's in a great spot out there. Yeah, I, I agree with you with the versatility aspect. I mean, you talk about a guy who could be used in several different ways. I think about the times on jet sweeps, he had a touchdown on one of those. as a I think one against uh, USF in 20, and then, of course, Indiana in 2021. Actually, you know what? I think, think, didn't he also have one against ECU this past year, Neil? Yeah, he did have one against ECU this season. I re- Yeah, that, that, that I literally just remembered that. So that happened, and I, I just feel like, for a Raiders team that really only has one perimeter weapon right now in Devontae Adams, Trey Tucker could be maybe the the guy on the opposite side. Now, for a guy like Tyler Scott, you look at the Bears roster, Neil, I don't see very many big-time receivers, big-name receivers in front of him. Josh Wiley, the same deal with the Titans. I mean, they don't have a great tight end room, so there's definitely the chance that all three of these guys find spots on rosters this upcoming season. Yeah, most definitely. And we can knock into uh, Tyler Scott and Josh Wiley a little bit. I love the fit for Tyler Scott to go to Chicago. We know they have lacked weapons on the outside for years to come in the past. They went this offseason. They made the big splurge, uh, went and traded the number one overall pick, brought in DJ Moore to pair alongside with a guy who has unlimited potential in Darnell Mooney. But if he stays healthy, that's been something that's been the downside for Darnell Mooney is can he stay healthy? So then they go out and you pair a guy like Tyler Scott next to Darnell Mooney. Chase Claypool's out there as well. So, I mean, if he can get back to his ways as he was as a Pittsburgh Steeler, and then you pair those three guys with Darnell Mooney, Chase Claypool, DJ Moore, and then you throw Tyler Scott into the mix as well. That that Bears offense is going to be really fun to watch, and I love it for Tyler. Um, obviously, covering him his whole career, I mean, he never had a touchdown under 20 yards. And all 14 of his touchdowns were over 20 yards in his career. So we know the ability. We know he has the quick speed, uh, the damage he can do in open space. But, man, he is a shifty route runner that's what a lot of teams drew comparisons to was his route running skills his ability to get open and he just shows shifty with the ball in his hands and we've seen it and i love the fit for him i think he'll go do great things out there in chicago especially if he gets that starting slot position but 
I think uh, Chicago was a, a dream location for Tyler. And I think uh, a lot of other people would say the same. But now let's talk about Josh Wiley because then you look down, Tennessee doesn't have many weapon, weapons down there as well either. So, I mean, and obviously Tennessee is a team who's got a great look at a guy in Josh Wiley because obviously Luke Fickle's good friend Mike Vrabel yeah. was attendance at the last two pro days for the Bearcats. And back in March, Josh Wiley really went off at pro day. He had a great pro day showing, in my opinion. Mike Vrabel was right there up close and personal to watch it. So I think he got a great a great look at what Josh Wiley can do. Obviously, we know he's a six foot six, 260-pound tight end. He can really go up and catch the ball, but he can also go out and catch passes. But when we talked to him after pro day, what was something unique about Josh Wiley was at the Senior Bowl, he clocked in at two – I believe it was 260 if I remember right. And then right before Pro Day, he clocked – he weighed in at about 249, I think was the exact number he told us. But 249, he said he feels comfortable playing at both both weights. But he loves to get physical in the blocks. He said it's that 10 pounds really makes a difference when it comes to being a pass-blocking tight end and really in the terms of moving somebody within that box. I mean, especially at the NFL, that's going to be a huge upside and play to – Josh Wiley's uh, favor in that aspect. So overall, I think both are great fits for those two guys. And I think they're both going to do big things down in uh, Chicago and Nashville. Really interesting with Tyler Scott, Neil, you bring it up that it's a perfect fit for him because as you mentioned, the Bears don't have a lot of weapons and you're right. They haven't had a weapon. I don't think they've had a weapon, a wide receiver, probably since Brandon Marshall was there. And that feels like 10 years ago. And I think he has the opportunity to stand out there in Chicago, a really good weapon for Justin Fields, who's still a young, developing quarterback. And then I think about Josh Wiley going to Tennessee. And I think about the Titans over the years, how much the tight ends have been a part of their offense. And maybe Josh Wiley, I I mean, look, fifth round pick, the odds are somewhat stacked against you, but there's still the opportunity, as we've seen with other, excuse me, mid to late round picks to carve out a nice role. So I I look at Josh Wiley in, in Tennessee. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of players standing in his way of being a good tight end. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with Wiley and the Titans, Scott and the Bears, and then Trey Tucker with the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. Real quick before we get to a live read here, Neil, what do you think about the other five Bearcats in addition to Ivan Pace Jr. who were signed as undrafted free agents by the uh we saw will will huber go to the vikings bush to seattle we saw leonard taylor go to the jaguars and there's two others i'm yeah. trying to remember Charles uh, McClellan Mets, went to the titans that's right and Mets has been out to chicago yes and james tunsell also announced yesterday that he has indeed signed with the miami dolphins on an undrafted free agent contract as well so there's now six of them yeah so we got seven total yeah so i overall i think i think they're all in good spots i mean obviously chuck has battled uh charles mcclellan has battled adversity since three years he had two major knee injuries and then he missed some other time with another injury so i mean he battled two ACL tears and then comes back and he's now finding himself for an NFL roster spot down in Tennessee. Obviously, he's behind some guys, Derrick Henry for one of them. And then he's got uh, some other big backs down there as well. So it's going to be interesting, but I think it's a great fit for him and personal, all personally. Uh, Lorenz Metz is an interesting offensive lineman prospect. We all know he has the size and the physicality. Uh, he battled injuries in 2022, so, I mean, that kind of limited him a little bit, but the size is there. The physicality is there. I think he'll be fine. Uh, I think he'll develop into a really good offensive lineman if he gets into the right system. Uh, Lenny Taylor's getting a great opportunity to go down to Jacksonville and learn from Evan Ingram, so I think that's a great fit for him uh, as well. I mean, Evan Ingram had his best season of his career down there in Jacksonville this uh this past season. So, I mean, then we talk Will Huber going out to Minnesota with uh, Ivan Pace. I think that's a good fit too, because Will Huber is also one of those guys who started out and transformed from, he came in, he was recruited as a tight end and then they transformed him into a linebacker. So, I mean, he used all six years, but I mean, he played a significant role 
in those six years, especially over the last two, three seasons for the Bearcats. And I think that's a great fit out there for him too. Obviously he's a bigger guy uh, with some size on him and he's one of those more athletic guys. He can do a lot of different things, whether it's on special teams or even there in that linebacker room. But the one I'm, the one I'm really happy for is James Tunsil, obviously just because of the situation he had to endure over his college uh, career. Cause I mean, for those who actually know more of his career, I know we had him on for an interview as well. So he gave us a little backstory of this, but James Tunsil transferred to the university of Cincinnati from Stony Brook in two, where he played in 2019. So the FCS level, and then he saw his 2020 season completely canceled due to COVID while at Stony Brook transferred to the Bearcats was a member of the college football playoff team. So after not having a season, he, you never know what could happen there. I mean, obviously you enter the portal and you're missing a whole year of film. So it, he took a big risk. He bet on himself and he went from FCS to a college football playoff team to now getting a contract with the Miami Dolphins. So, I mean, it just adds to the story. I mean, his story's not done. Neither of these guys' stories are done, but I think it's a great story for James. I mean, obviously you go from that kind of caliber, the FCS, to seeing your whole season canceled. The next thing you know, you're on an NFL roster. So, I, I think I think it's a pretty unique situation for him, and I I'm glad for all these guys. So uh, I think it's very cool, and I think I think these guys have great futures. Obviously, Seattle gets uh, Arquan Bush back out there now to pair himself back up with former teammate and Kobe Bryant. So Kobe Bryant had a, a very good rookie season. So I think that's a great mentor to have, especially out there on a undrafted free agent uh, contract. So I think they all ended up in really good positions. So. I guess we'll have to see how things play out here as the uh, mini camp and OTAs unfold. Yeah, it's going to be a really interesting four months coming up for these Bearcats who were just drafted or signed as undrafted free agents. Great perspective, great detail as always. Neil, we'll uh, we'll get to. I want to ask you a question about Scott Satterfield that I was talking with some uh, people at at an event, a UC alumni event this weekend up here. In Columbus, I want to get your opinion on that. And then I want to ask you about just how much Simus Lukosius elevates the Cincinnati Bearcats men's basketball roster. We'll do all of that after I explain to all of you how this episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by Built Bar. Looking for a delicious snack, but you don't want all of the sugar and calories. Then you need the best tasting protein bar ever. Built, you got to try this. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're all covered in 100% real, real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and cookies and cream. And now you don't need to wait to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. While you can still get your specialty flavors still at Built.com. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Bill Parts. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream bar, double chocolate bar, or coconut puff. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors. Brownie batter puff and churro puff. You can thank me later. Thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. For everyday listeners on tomorrow's show, Zach Freeze from the Freeze Frame Podcast and PFF will join me to discuss all things Bearcats in the draft. And, of course, a player I know he's really excited about joining the men's basketball program, Simus Lukosius. Back with Neil Meyer of the Front Office News and the 48 Minutes Network, uh, beat writer and podcast host. Neil, I was talking to some people at this UC alumni event I was at this weekend. And what stood out to me was... Someone said, I asked them what they think about Scott Satterfield. And the, the answer they gave me was, I don't know much about him. And you can take that in multiple ways, I feel like. But are you in the boat where you need to see him coach a game, heck, maybe even coach the full season, before you can truly judge him as a head coach? Are you in that boat? I'm not in that boat. Obviously, everyone who has followed and did their extensive research on Scott Satterfield, they saw what he was able to do at Louisville. They know what he brings to the table. He's got a great coaching staff here around him. I think uh, I think a lot of people really are going to be surprised at what the Bearcats do this season. And I think I think they're in great hands. I, I really have enjoyed 
what I've watched so far. We saw a lot at the spring game, and you, if for those who were in attendance at the spring game, I know myself and yourself included, we both were there yeah. in attendance. So we got an up close and personal. We covered spring ball the way throughout. It's it's easy to see what he is doing here at Cincinnati, and it they're in great hands, and it's going to be it's going to be a fun season. So I'm very excited okay. to see what goes on and what he is able to do, especially with the defense that returns all the key starters that they have. He has a great a great coaching staff around him. He's bringing in the right pieces, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. So you, people who haven't heard much about Scott Satterfield, take a look at go back and do some research about the numbers he put up at Louisville, the players he's developed at Louisville, because we just talked about the guys who got drafted from the university of Cincinnati. Louisville had quite a few guys drafted this weekend as well. So safe to say that he knows what he's doing. He's developing these guys. And overall, he's just a great human being too. From every interaction I've had with him, he's a great human being. So, and that's what you like to have. So Overall, you build those genuine relationships, and I think the Bearcats are in great hands, and I'm very excited for what he's be- going to be able to build heading into year one in the Big 12. Wow, wow. so you're you're really optimistic, because mm-hmm. I am too, a- 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 as you know from the conversations we've had and th- the amount of times that I've had you on this show, Neil. But I, I did say to our – I did say to our listeners – or I did say to uh, – excuse me – to those who listen to Locked on Bearcats, I said – that I need to see him coach a game in a season before I can judge him. And I said that from the from the perspective of there are those out there who don't think he's going to do well. But I said to those people, give him one season. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. And, you know, I said to someone over the weekend, he's not going to be Luke Fickle. But then what if they but then what if he leads the Bearcats to a national championship? Then what do you say? And I keep going back to this, Neil. The one thing Scott Satterfield has that I think is so beneficial is a solid foundation that he's coming into. The Bearcats football program has multiple things that that it didn't have when Luke Fickle got here in 2017. They have a foundation. They have a passion for the unit. They have a passionate fan base that is off the charts right now. And they have resources. And they have the Big 12. Like, Neil, Neil, did you ever, have you thought about this? And, and this hit me a few days ago. The Bearcats have played, this will be their fifth conference in the last 35 years. How about that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty crazy to think. Obviously, they saw the transition from the Big East to the American and now to the Big 12. So, overall... I, I'm excited for what's next. Obviously, the last few seasons have been incredible. The Big East Conference back when they were in it was always tremendous battles day in and day out. You always have the memories of Pike to Ben, so you will have those memories. You have a passionate fan base, but the Big 12 right now, like everything is trending in the right direction. Like there's these Big 12 teams, they're, they're gauntlets of teams, and we've seen it, especially – here in the NFL draft, you look back and you see how many players got drafted from the Big 12 alone. And then you see what the Big 12 is able to do year in and year out within within the uh, college football aspect. And now you have to think with the playoffs going to 12 teams, it, it's going to be fun. It's, it's going to be really fun. There's a lot of high-quality teams here within the Big 12. Obviously, you start with Oklahoma, Texas for a year uh, before they make that transition out. And – there, there's a lot of fun teams here in the Big 12. Obviously, you have TCU who's coming off a national championship run. So, overall, like, I, this is going to be a really fun, a fun, exciting season. Obviously, they have made the memories there over the last few years. They built that foundation, as you mentioned. But the foundation is built, and they're just going to keep building off of it. I, I'm going to endorse you to be on my campaign for the Oklahoma game to be a nip at night game. I mean, Neil, how can it not be? Yeah, How if you that- put that game at nip at night, it's it's going to be wild. And I think it's safe to say if it is a uh, nip at night game, the last time Dylan Gabriel was at Nippert Stadium yes. was indeed a nip at night game where we all got introduced to a mod sauce gardener. Yes. So I think it's only fitting, but only time will tell if that will be a nip at night game. Yes. With the history, were you, were you at that game? I was at that game. Okay. That was, that was not only that, we had that game 
And then we had uh, Midnight Madness. Mm-hmm. I, I, I almost forgot what it was called. Yep, Midnight Madness was immediately after it. So those yes. two are always good games to get involved with, whether it's Nip at Night and the Midnight Madness right after it. Those are always two fun things. So especially gotcha. now heading to the Big 12, I'm only looking forward to what's going on, going to happen okay. at those events. Well, they should bring back Midnight Madness with the Bearcats going to the Big 12. Maybe we'll get to that on another show. Uh, but after this, let's talk about – let's go to the hardwood, Neil, because the Bearcats just landed another huge commit – and a player that potentially could really elevate this Bearcats men's basketball program. We'll get into that. So, Neil, the Bearcats, and you were uh, – we, we missed having you on last week, but since we last talked, Neil, the Bearcats have signed not one, but two key transfers. C.J. Frederick from uh, Kentucky, and I, I, was, I was almost going to say Iowa. He did play for Iowa at one point. Also a Cincinnati native from Covcat High School. Neil, remind me again, where, where did you go to high school? I know you're a Cincinnati kid. Where did you, where'd you go to high school again? Uh, I went to Oak Hills on the west side. Oak Hills, okay. See, that's one of three main questions you get as Cincinnatians. Where did you go to high school? Mm-hmm. Skyline or Chile? And east or west side? So that's three main questions you get asked. So, and I guess maybe Cincinnati or Xavier. But, of course, we know the answer to that question. But, Neil... <laughs> Neil, the Bearcats land C.J. Frederick. Then they land Simus Lukosius. So, like, where are you right now in terms of your excitement for next year's with the next year with the roster and the expectations for this program? Yeah, I'm. I'm actually pretty happy. I was pretty fired up for the both of those commits. Obviously, uh, C.J. Frederick was a guy that Wes Miller recruited very hard when he went in the portal the first time when Wes took the job. Do you see for people who didn't know and he ultimately chose Kentucky. I mean, obviously, Kentucky's a lot of kids' dreams, dream schools, dream destinations in terms of uh, college basketball. But it's it was only fitting for the grad transfer to come home. Obviously, C.J. Frederick will technically still have two years of eligibility left if he gets a medical redshirt, which it sounds like he might. And so if you could get C.J. for potentially two years, that's that's – phenomenal especially knowing his history as a as a shooter but he has battled some injuries over the the last few seasons and they weren't like injuries that are like common they're like completely freak accidents I mean like the one injury was him diving into a camera if I remember right and taking a camera to the ribs and doing some damage there to the ribs I mean that's that's something you can't you can't predict so but now if he gets a full a fully healthy CJ Frederick to pair alongside Asimus Lukosius. And you also got to throw in guys in the factor of Rayvon Griffith, Jizzle James, Dan Skillings, and you also have John Newman returning. Like, I think this is probably going to be the best Bearcats team we've seen in recent years. Obviously, the transition, we saw them make that jump from year one to year two under Wes Miller. But right now, I love what they're doing in the portal. I mean, you go out and you get a guy who's a 40% three-point shooter in C.J. Frederick. I mean that's that's something the Bearcats needed, especially after you're losing a guy like uh, losing guys like Jeremiah Davenport to Arkansas. Then you lose your two top two leading scorers and David DeJulius and Landers Nolly, who both are arguably going to go pursue professional careers. Obviously, Landers has uh, put his name in the NBA draft, but then you bring in guys like C.J. Frederick, who can really shoot the ball from behind the arc, but he can do a lot of other things too. Like he's He's a very good passer. He can make very good reads. He just makes the team better. And overall, then you bring in a six foot seven guard from Butler and Simus Lukosius. And I mean, this is a guy that started 32 games last season for uh, Butler. He averaged nearly 12 points a game, four rebounds, and three assists, playing nearly 33 minutes a game. So this was a guy who saw significant playing time, but he shot 30, almost 39% from behind the arc as well. He's an 85% career free throw shooter, so you know you're going to get some points at the line with him. But he's another guy who has two years left of eligibility. So, I mean, and this is a guy who's played in a lot of high-level basketball overseas. And, I mean, we saw what he was able to do in the tournament this year, the Big East tournament. He had 28 points versus uh, Villanova, I believe. Yep, career-high 28 versus Villanova. And then he had 23 versus uh, St. John's in the Big East tournament. But you look back at Simon Lukosius' playing career, like he played in the 
uh, won the highest levels in Germany overseas in, two, in 2020 to 2021. And then he also played on the Pro B circuit from 2019 to 2020. So, I mean, he also competed in Bayern, in Bayern Munich. So, I mean, he the talent's there. Like, he has the experience. And anytime you can add those bigger guards, those guys who can really get physical, I mean, he's not a small guy. I mean, I think I saw he weighed like 225, 230. Like, that's a, that's a big point guard. And overall, he brings a lot to the table. He's an offensive-minded guy, but one of those nitty-gritty guys as well. So, Overall, those two additions are massive. Yeah. And I think this recruiting class that Wes Miller has brought in this offseason within the portal, and then you we mentioned guys like Rayvon Griffith and Jizzle James. I mean, we know they brought in uh, Day-Day Thomas as well. So, overall, this class that they're bringing in, like they're bringing in some guys, some hoopers. So, it's going to be very exciting to watch, and it's only going to keep going up from here. Yeah, I think another thing too, Neil, and you bring up a lot of great points that I think about – is Simus Lukosius improved heavily in several mm-hmm. statistical categories last year from year one to year two at Butler. And I also think about with guys like him and CJ Frederick, you know, they're coming from the Big Ten and the Big East. The Big Ten, the Big East, and the in the in the Big 12, you could argue were the three best conferences in college basketball. So these guys have played at major program major programs. They played at They've played in a lot of tough environments. They have a lot of experience and the fact that they have two years of eligibility. Now you combine that with Frederick's outside shooting abilities. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much concern on his three point shooting last year. He was coming off an injury that ultimately wiped out his entire 21, 22 season. But Neil, then I think about Simon's the versatility in this team last year, they had a lot of players who could do a lot of things. They had players or a lot of players who did certain things well, but they didn't do a lot of things well, and they made them easy to guard at times. I think this team could be a lot more versatile, especially when you bring in a guy like Simus Lukosius. So do you agree with that, and just how much do you think a guy like Lukosius can elevate this program this year back to hopefully the NCAA tournament? Yeah, Simus Lukosius' versatility is something that really – gave himself a lot of options within the portal. I mean, we saw he was narrowing down his options, and I believe his final three was Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and Cincinnati. So either way, those are all Big 12 schools, Big 12 programs. So he was gaining high interest, and his versatility is there. And I think he'll boost this program in many ways. As you mentioned, I mean, you think back, you know, we saw the jumps he made from year one to year two at Butler, but now that he's gotten comfortable and he's going to get into it it might be a little different of a scheme and he fits in like he he'll fit he'll be fine and you add that you pair that alongside with a team that has so much veteran leadership and presence I mean you look down at the Bearcats roster now Jamil Reynolds is going to be on his third year uh between UCF and Temple and then you bring in a guy like uh CJ Frederick who has experience playing at the Big Ten and the SEC level and then on top of that, you have guys like John Newman, who's coming back for his extra year of eligibility. Odia Guama is returning for his extra year of eligibility. So these guys, and Mike Adams-Woods is using his as well. So they have the veteran leadership there as well. And I think those guys will fit in just fine. Yeah. I think the eligibility thing, too, is what I really like about these, these, these commits, Neil, because it's not like they're just one-year rentals. You know, they're going to be here for potentially a couple of years. And – they're coming from major programs, which I think is also really important. And it speaks to, I, I just feel like Wes Miller, not only his abilities in the in recruiting, but the transfer portal. And, you know, I know it's been a rough, what, four years for Bearcats basketball fans, but I do think, and look, the competition's going to be enormously tougher in the Big 12. But I do think there's that opportunity to get back to where I, I, I'm going to say it, the Bearcats belong, and that is the NCAA tournament. Yeah, no, most definitely. I'm right there with you, and I think I think they will bounce back. And this is the season where we saw them make that uh, NIT tournament run, which was a step in the right direction, obviously, uh, especially making that uh, quarterfinals run there in the NIT. I thought they were moving that uh, ball in the right direction. And with the additions here in the transfer portal, I mean, we saw how the Big 12 ended up last year. West Virginia lost their, like, first eight games in conference play and still made the NCAA tournament. And if the Bearcats yeah. 
go in there and they have a good season in the Big 12, even if it's a 500 season within conference play, they still have a chance to make the uh, NCAA tournament if we go off the records that happened in 2020 because West Virginia was a team that only went about 500 in the conference, but the Big 12 – had a, I believe it was 10 teams make the NCAA tournament this past season. So yeah. I think the Bearcats will fit in perfectly just fine. And I think this is the season where they could really take that next step and get back to the NCAA tournament as well. I agree with you. I really do. Neil Meyer of the front office news in the 48 minutes network joining me today as he does most weeks. Uh, Neil, where can, uh, where can listeners find your work? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at Meyer Neil six. You can also make sure to f- check out our work at thefrontofficenews.com and 48 Minutes uh, Basketball Network as well. You can check us out on there. We are all on uh, all platforms podcasts. We do have a podcast called The At-Large Bid with myself and Parker Fields as the co-host. Uh, that is all on Spotify, Apple Podcast. Uh, the 48 Minutes Basketball Network as well is all on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcast. So you can find all of our work on all those platforms. and. You can find us on Twitter at the front office news as well. Yeah. All good stuff. Neil Meyer. Hope to talk to you sometime next week. We got the NFL schedule coming out next week, Neil. So we can see where the Bearcats are going to play, what the Bengals schedule is going to look like. I, I, I can't wait for that to happen next Thursday, but uh, until then, Neil, best wishes to you and uh, keep doing well. All right. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you guys for having me on. Neil Meyer front office news, the front office news, excuse me, joining me today here on Locked on Bearcats on this Wednesday, May 3rd, back tomorrow. Zach Freeze from the Freeze Frame Podcast and the and Pro Football Focus will join me to discuss all things Bearcats in the draft and Simus Lukosius plus C.J. Frederick. Thanks for making Locked on Bearcats your first listen of every day. As I mentioned, Zach Freeze will join me tomorrow. I should say, excuse me, Zach Freeze will join me tomorrow. Uh, with some scheduling uh, things we need to work out, but hopefully he will join me tomorrow. If not, I'll have something good for you on tomorrow, Thursday. Hard to believe it's already Thursday. Thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. I'm on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty, Instagram Alex Frank Nat underscore email Alex 3 Frank at gmail.com. For Lockdown Bearcats, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day, I'm Alex Frank for Lockdown Bearcats. Have a great rest of your day, and I'm back tomorrow right here on Lockdown Bearcats.